Well, one year ago on Health Report, we took a look into the future of healthcare. Online health, virtual medicine and patient self-service were just some of the trends we touched on with the worldwide health director of Microsoft, Dr Bill Crowns. So in just 12 months, have any of these gained ground in Australia? And in a time of global economic recession, how has the changing landscape changed the face of our well-being? Sky News reporter Natalie Murray got the latest from Dr Dr Bill Crowns. Dr Crowns, welcome back to Health Report. Thank you, Natalie. It was around a year ago that we last spoke about the future of health care and what was on the way in terms of technology. How much change have we seen in, that, in this past year? Well, I think the change we're seeing is incremental and probably not as much as all of us would like to see. But we're living in very, shall we say, interesting times right now. Uh, governments, both in Australia uh, and in America, are almost on parallel tracks in a way with bad economies, probably worse in America than in Australia right now, and a lot of attention being paid to stimulating the economy, government stimulus programs, and a lot of investment, interestingly enough, in health and healthcare information technology in both countries. And in fact, your country has recently published a document, the National Health and Hospital Reform uh, Commission Report. And in that document is lots of information that points toward a, a new future, I think, for health and the way it's delivered. I'd like to ask you about the document and a couple of points that have been raised in it and your view. One is the creation of, of a one-stop health shop, so you've got GPs and chemists and other professionals together in a more suburban type environment. Is that something that you think is, is a good plan? I think in situations where patients travel to go to a clinic, uh, having sort of one-stop shopping is a great idea. It really uh, increases the efficiency of care and getting people to the specialists that they need. So in that regard, it's very good. Now, one of the problems in Australia is you have huge geography. And so there's a need to how do you reach out to people and, and how if they can't travel always to the clinic where they get that kind of one-stop shopping, what else can you do to bring services to people closer to home, uh, monitoring them at home, uh, giving them connectivity to maybe that primary care center or clinic that's at a distance. Well, another point that was raised was support for a, a uh, national computer-based network for medical records, so people have their own medical files accessible electronically. I imagine that's something that you're in support of. Uh, absolutely, and it's interesting, again, in both countries, America and Australia, we are approximately on five-year time frames to get healthcare information electronic. What's interesting is a new model has emerged for doing that, whereas before a lot of people talked about, oh, the way you do that is you have to interconnect every pharmacy, every clinic, every hospital, you know, throughout the entire country and two-way bi-directional information. And a lot of people are now looking at a new model that's emerged and is being popularized by things like Microsoft Health Vault or Google Health or in sometimes even uh, countries or states doing a, what's called a medical banking project where instead of that total interconnected network, you're taking health information and giving the patient a copy in a place in the cloud on the internet that they can manage and that they can share with whomever they want to share it with. So it accomplishes the same thing. The patient or consumer gets the always available, truly transportable electronic record that moves with them and throughout their lifetime, but it's under their control and it's their copy and they determine who they want to share it with. Is there an element of risk involved if putting a patient's medical record under their control though? Should well, that be in, the, in well, the hands of the professional? Well, so keep in mind there's, there's a a version that the consumer populates information and then there's a piece of it that is populated by healthcare provider organizations and the consumer cannot change the piece that's provided by your official medical record but in the same way you know when a patient comes into my office and gives me their story about their health their background and so forth we call that the subjective history and that's always subjective and you can tell me or not tell me what you're going to you know or hide things or whatever and, and that's part of your record as well all right, well, I'd like to talk to you about online health, mm -hmm. something that's been ever increasing with the popularity of the internet as the place that many people will go first nowadays for information. Yeah. I'd like to ask you about self-diagnosis online. There are many websites now where you can simply type in your symptoms and it'll throw back a, a, a certain condition or a few to choose from. 
How much risk do you feel is involved in that? I would imagine it's fraught with danger with misinformation, but it is free, it is convenient. Yeah. Can it work? Uh, you know, I actually applaud all this health information on the net. And the reason I do, I mean, if you look at the way people used to get health information, first of all, it was hard to get. Secondly, I mean, in the past, you might have asked your brother, your sister, your mother-in-law, you know, and you might equally get very bad information. So in a way, the internet has really been a way that people can find information. We're seeing this whole idea of social networking among patients where groups of patients with serious disease are coming together sharing information about what drugs and what treatments and kind of what's going on around the world. What I generally implore my colleagues to do, my, my other physicians, is to help direct, I mean this being the case, the information's out there, the internet's out there, you can't stop that. To take some time to direct their patients to sites on the internet that they feel are providing really good information. Uh, one of the things we've done at our company is actually created a special search engine for looking for health information. It's currently mainly available in the US, but it, it does a very nice job of pointing you to the good stuff. I would also say, for just for consumers in general, you know, if you look to sites, they're sponsored by associations, and they're a .gov, a government site, a .edu, an educational site, or a .org, a non-commercial site. Generally, that information is going to be more reliable than maybe a .com site that's trying to sell you something. Is it turning us into a bunch of hypochondriacs, though? <laughs> now all you need is a little ache or a little niggle, and then you're going online and think that you've got all these certain diseases or conditions, when previously you would think, well, if it's not that bad, I won't bother going to the doctor, and it goes away by itself. Well, that, the good news about the human body is it does have remarkable ability to heal itself, <laughs> thankfully, okay? Um, yeah, there was this, this term cyberchondria that was coined, uh, I think, about the year 2000 as the internet was coming along. And it's, it's true. I mean, it's the old story of medical students in training who suddenly have whatever disease they're studying. Uh, it's universally a human trait for us to kind of fret about things. But again, I think if you work with your doctor and you're pointing to the, the good sites information, I actually see being informed about your health and having some tools to take action on it as being a, a very good thing. And as we move toward more e-health services and so forth, I mean, our whole motto is improving health around the world through software innovation. We think software has a, a huge ability to connect people, uh, um, to improve the way your care team communicates and collaborates. There's a lot we can do in healthcare that we're, we're, we're simply have kind of a broken system today and uh, a lot of people are talking about oh but the economy and the recession and isn't this terrible well and sometimes an, a bad economy stimulates new thinking about the way we've been doing things I think that may be the case here well, I'd like to ask you about the impacts of the recession on health it does mean that people at home are tightening their belts yes. spending less money which may mean simply not going to the doctor at all when they're feeling unwell, cancelling their medical insurance or, or self-diagnosis online. Yes. What and, are the and, those, and those would be very bad things for society. I mean, we certainly don't want people waiting on symptoms. Uh, we don't want them going unnecessarily to the emergency room either because we need to keep costs under control. Um, that's why I think it's so important that we create these new lines of communication between patients and doctors that are very efficient and very prudent. Um, if you have a question and you email your doctor and your doctor and government insurers will support reimbursement for that, your doctor can play a very important role in, in giving you the reassurance or pointing you in the right direction that you need. So human intervention is still a very good thing in all of this, you know, but we, we need better tools than, as we discussed last year, you know, getting on the phone, trying to make an appointment, driving somewhere, waiting around, all of that hassle factor. Well, you're talking about the recession being perhaps opportunistic for health, a chance mm -hmm. to reform, to streamline. How is the money best spent when we're trying to keep costs down, but investment in technology and research is always going to be needed. I think investments that help get people the information they need, that get very creative in defining new ways to access health information and medical services, that are much more strategic about the way the workforce is deployed, because we have shortages of healthcare workers, so they too need these very powerful tools to be more efficient in, in how they communicate and collaborate and work together both in a care team and with their patients. These are things that we can do that really will add a lot of cost burden and, and actually can take out a lot of costs from unnecessary tests, duplicate services, people running around burning up gasoline and taking time off work and all of that that's not needed. All right, well, lots to cover. We'll probably see you in another year from I now. I hope so. Always enjoy coming to Australia. Thanks, Dr. Bill Crowns. Thanks, Natalie.